Planets are enormous objects in outer space. Right now, there are six trillion, trillion kilograms of rock and water and people and a lot of ants and other biomass beneath my feet. As humans have defined them, planets are huge and roughly spherical. But are all planets solid? Now entering the facility. The idea that humanity is living inside of a planet rather than on it, or at least there's something underneath the surface besides a terawatt level underground laboratory has been going around for a long time. For example, the ancient Greeks thought there were a system of underground caves and caverns that led to another world an underworld. And slightly more recently, the scientist Edmund Halley of Halley's Comet proposed that the Earth was not solid, it was in fact a series of concentric shells. This begs the question, can hollow planets exist, and is Earth one of those planets? Well, let's begin with how we define a, define a planet. <laughs> nice hair, dude. <laughs> now, where did I put that? Ah, here it is, observe, my cup of science. Inside of this cup of science, I have both water and vegetable oil, substances that don't mix, they are immiscible. And they tend to separate themselves because of both pressure and gravity. As a consequence of that, because water is more dense than this vegetable oil, even when I mix everything up very well, it will start to separate itself out again. Now, when everything comes to a rest because of gravity and pressure and density, this system is now in what we call hydrostatic equilibrium. And this concept is not useful for just defining the layers of cups of science. It helps us define planets. A planet like Earth or Mars is a lot of stuff, but a certain amount of stuff. Take Jupiter, for example. This gas giant is massive enough to round itself out under its own gravity, but not so massive that gravitational forces ignite thermonuclear fusion in its core and turn Jupajup into a star. And the reason why planets will round themselves out under gravitational forces is that when you have enough mass to be a planet, that gravitational force overcomes the rigid forces of your own material and makes solids move like fluids. Yes, even rock can flow. So planets, as humans define them, are under hydrostatic equilibrium, just like our oil and water example. And so, for hollow planets to be a thing, they would have to be strong enough in their shells to fight off those gravitational forces trying to solidify and spherify them. And that strength is something that we can calculate. Oh, hello. What am I doing? Well, I'm using a spoon to dig to the center of the Earth. That would be one way to tell if the Earth was hollow, right? If you could dig all the way down and crack some kind of inner shell. But unfortunately, humans aren't that good at digging. Right now, the deepest hole in the world, the Kola Super Deep Borehole, yeah, real original name, I know, is only about 12 kilometers deep. Right now, from the surface of the Earth down to the core, it's about 6,400 kilometers. So, uh, digging, oddly enough, has not yet ruled out a hollow Earth because humans have not drilled down but 1% of the Earth's radius. So if you excuse me, by my calculation, I have about 100 million more kilograms of rock to spoon. So, uh, on your way, on your way. If a planet is to be hollow, it better be seriously strong, and Arya here can help us calculate that strength. Strength? Are you sure you should be doing this? Nice one. Most hollow Earth theories go something like this. All of humanity lives on the inside of a planet shell, and there's a sun at the center. It's a wild idea, but we should still math it anyway. This idea is analogous to another shell around a star conception, the Dyson Sphere, named after recently past genius Freeman Dyson. There are a number of papers that calculate the actual required strength for Dyson Sphere, so we can use the same equations therein to get how strong a hollow planet shell would have to be for these theories to be correct. Aria, run Dyson Sphere Projection 7. The first six I didn't carry like any of the decimals. Go ahead. According to the paper, Dyson Spheres Around White Dwarfs from 2015, the compressive strength of the material for a rigid Dyson Sphere 
can be shown to be gm over 2r times rho, where g is Newton's gravitational constant, m is the mass of the interior star, r is the radius of the shell, and rho is the density of the shell. If we plug even very conservative numbers into this equation, like the mass of Earth's sun, the density and radius of Earth, you still get a required strength on the order of 57 petapascals. That's 57 thousand trillion newtons of force on every square meter of this shell. That's what it would have to put up with. And if that sounds like a lot, that's because it is. This exceeds the theoretical maximum strength of matter. There is less pressure at the center of the sun. There is less pressure at the center of a nuclear detonation. If humans are right about any of these numbers, like the mass of the sun and the density of the earth, then the concept of a hollow planet really shouldn't exist. You know, like FaceTiming in public without headphones. hey -o. Oh, wait, wait, I'm getting a notification. It says that the majority of facility faculty didn't enjoy the music mix at the Android ball? What are you, ta what are you talking about? That music slapped. I knew Kevin shouldn't have DJed. Kevin! Not everything in hydrostatic equilibrium is necessarily a planet. It's just one of those conditions that we need to be there to be a planet. For example, the smallest object confirmed to be in hydrostatic equilibrium is the dwarf planet Ceres. See, not a planet. And the largest object that we know of that's not in equilibrium is Earth's own moon, which is 77 times larger than Ceres. In these border cases, the formation and composition of these objects is really important. Planet ship can be particularly complicated. Just look at Pluto. It's okay. We all still love you. The laws of physics may discourage hollow planets from really being a thing, but who's to say that the Earth just isn't some special case and that humanity really does live inside of a hollow shell? Well, math says that. Math does. Think about what it would actually feel like to live inside a planet shell. Well, if I was inside a planet shell right now, I would feel some gravitational force at my feet because there's shell underneath my feet. But I would also feel some tugging at the top of my head from the parts of the shell above my head, though that force would be less because that mass is further away. Now, you can do this same analysis for every part of my body and every part of the shell, and what you find is that all of these forces, when summed up, exactly cancel out leaving me weightless no matter where I am inside of this shell. This was first proven mathematically by intellectual lad Isaac Newton in his shell theorem. This means that if humans really were living in a hollow earth right now, you'd be able to tell because everything and everyone would be just floating around weightless, which does sound pretty fun to be honest. There's another planet-sized problem with the idea of a hollow Earth too, and that is protection. Without a core at the center of Earth, without all the heat and pressure and molten metal that comes with it, there is no giant spinning ball of nickel and iron that, in tandem with Earth's rotation, creates a magnetic field. And without this magnetosphere, Earth and its inhabitants would be quickly fried by incoming cosmic radiation. And then if this theory was true, you just have a big shell with a bunch of irradiated floating earthling corpses in it, which is terrible. The fact is, from physics and direct observation, we can be fairly confident that no true hollow planets exist in the universe and that the Earth is itself not hollow. It's almost like this theory is hollow. <laughs> Uh, oh, you get it? Because hollow is, oh, Dr. Jeff is going to slap his fins when he hears this one. Oh, <laughs> because it's, that is He'll be at this a while. Until next time, now exiting the facility. Oh, wow. It's good to laugh. Thank you so much to the facility's very nerdy faculty for their help in directly producing this video, especially assistant researcher Adam Frost and visiting scholar Luke 
Cashman. The facility gets the majority of its revenue from faculty members and from our Patreon. If you want to join our Patreon and our Discord, where right now literally hundreds of nerds are talking to each other, giving me episode ideas, posting photos of their lizards and cats, you can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill or you can go to the link in the description. You also get videos a day early, live streams, behind the scenes content, and maybe even your name on Aria. So you'll want to do that. Science videos today for a nerdier tomorrow. That's still going, huh? Well, there's a lot of you, so I'm just gonna, I guess I'm just gonna ride this one out. It's longer than last time. I'm gonna go. Okay, here we go. And thanks for watching. <laughs>